All right. Cheeky Midweeky. I think this is the first uh, doctor we've had on the Cheeky Midweeky. <laughs> Dr. Sam Spinelli. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I don't normally go by doctor, but I appreciate it. <laughs> right, you pay all that money, you do all that training, you might as well use the title. That's, that's a fair perspective. <laughs> so um, to the uninitiated, what, what's your background? What do you do? Uh, I'm a strength conditioning coach and a doctor of physical therapy. Started off as a strength coach, spent a long time working in the mostly professional hockey scene and then transitioned to get my doctorate. And then I spent the last few years just kind of interweaving back and forth between them. What prompted the move? Uh, well, I was at a high performance facility where we would refer people out for injuries and it got pretty frustrating because a lot of times we'd refer people out and they would just essentially say, stop training. And it was like, that doesn't seem like the right answer. And then um, I didn't really know what the right answer was and I wanted to try to figure it out. And so I reached out to other individuals that I knew had more education in this area, such as Charlie Weingroff. And their answer was, go get the education. So I was like, fuck it, why not? Let's go do it. So um, I didn't realize quite the undertaking I was about to do just to get those answers. But uh, yeah, I just thought, why not? I thought it would just help me be a better professional. Uh, at the end of the day, I wasn't necessarily looking to be a physical therapist, even though that was the education. But I wanted to be the best strength and conditioning coach I could be. And I thought that that would facilitate it. Yeah, it's one of, you know, Charlie was one of the names that I wrote down that I was going to ask you about whether he was an inspiration. And there's, there's actually a few people that I've spoken to within high performance sport where they've, they've been in both those worlds that have ended up becoming high performance directors because it appears to me that now to be a really good HPM, you have to at least have knowledge of what it is physical therapists are doing in order to, to oversee them. So like David Joyce has done both. Mm. Uh, Darcy Norman, Charlie, guys like that. So I wondered if that was like the model that you'd kind of like tried to take from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I had a lot of influence when I was an early strength coach too from people that were not necessarily physical therapists, but they were people that had a lot of rehab education like Dean Somerset. Uh, he was like yeah. one of my first mentors in the field and getting involved with those people, they just always pushed how much uh, a physical therapist could be a benefit of either having as a resource or having that extra education. So it just seemed like the best route to go down. Not necessarily sure that it is uh, as a strength coach, but it was very valuable for the role that I do fill. How did you find the, the curriculum going in? Because obviously when you're like a dyed in the wool meathead strength coach, there's going to be a, a healthy amount of, well, in both directions, a healthy amount of skepticism. And I'm not sure about the curriculum that you went through, but certainly there are, there are places out there where it's like, oh, well, you know, I learned how to help an old person that had a stroke put on their shirt, but not do like high level sporting orthopedic injuries. Yes, yeah, so that's definitely, definitely the case. Uh, I say that from day one, I made a big, big demonstration of who I was just because we literally had the first class where we learned how to wash our hands. And then we learned basic biomechanics of lifting things. And I started off by picking up a box with a deadlift. And I just got actually absolutely demolished by my professor. Not bending your knees. <laughs> oh yeah. They were like, oh, you need to be bending up, staying completely vertical. You should let your heels come off the ground, blah, 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 blah. blah. And I was like, okay, I don't know if I made the right choice. <laughs> and, uh, Definitely got to a heated discussion with them. And uh, they, they're like, okay, so you're one of those deadlift guys then. I'm like, yes, I am in fact one of those deadlift guys. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was the preceding thing for the next few years, which I will give credit to my school. They were, some of the professors were unwilling to discuss things. And then I had a good handful of professors who were open to seeing how things could change. And now, since I've left the school, they, they've changed a lot of their curriculum, and I've actually been back and forth as essentially an adjunct professor and helped to improve some of the curriculum, particularly in the therapeutic exercise. And they added on an um, elective class for strength and conditioning, and they've really tried to bump it up a lot. And one of the professors there has uh, gotten very involved in the strength and conditioning community, and he's really trying to push better options for the students just because, yeah, at the end of the day, if you're lucky, you might learn a few basic exercises across one semester and in reality like the vast majority of what a physical therapist should probably do is prescribe exercise and yeah. they just have literally no idea what they're doing one of one of the things that i particularly about athletic training in the states is i i feel like the curriculums have gone the way they have 
specifically because all of the, the modalities they use are scalable. So if you want to do ice, stim, heat, you know, oh, here's a foam roller or that kind of stuff, you can scale that way easier than, oh, okay, you actually have to do like movement-based therapies, exercise or that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good point because for the average athletic therapist, like if they're working with 24 guys, it's going to be quite overwhelming to try to go across all of them and give them an appropriate uh, exercise program. Yeah, you can just slap on a TENS unit, walk away. Yeah. Do you feel that that title of being like a DPT has, it, it just like buys you more credibility to make the statements that you would have made five years ago anyway? And it's like, it just opens the door to you. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. It's pretty outrageous in my opinion, but it does. Yeah. It, it, it was even funny because I got into a, I don't know, I've always been a person to get into arguments and I have no problem to uh, <laughs> go down a dark path. And while I was a student, I, I started to like really build my online persona just because I was pissed off and frustrated in school. And I started to get into a lot of discussions with other uh, straight coaches, other, uh, other physical therapists, the whole gambit. And I remember getting to this argument and I was about two months away from graduating and they're like, well, you're not even a physical therapist. It's like, okay, well, I'll be a physical therapist in two months. So is that the yeah. point of which I'm now allowed to say these things? Yeah. And it's just pretty outrageous that this small title suddenly dictates that I have this knowledge, even though I can have it way before. It was, it was the same for me with, um, you know, Argentinian rugby, like we, we suck dick for a couple of years. And I was like, you don't need to Olympic lift, you know, rugby players. And then we're like, oh, yeah. South Africa do them and they beat you. And then we, we beat them and I was like, oh, you know, suddenly I'm a good strength coach. And it's off topic. I wasn't going to ask you about it, but like in terms of the social media, like you, you've built a very, very big following. How strategic are you about it? Or do you think that you, you know, you're authentic, you put out good value stuff and it just kind of like the stars align? <laughs> I'd say uh, I'm not very strategic about it. I'd, 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 I obviously do take some intent and uh, I'm not an idiot. Like I don't just throw up random things without any effort, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think, I I think have, you, I, I think you build very, a very in line with business and brand uh, persona. So I, and it, I it's do done have well a very specific question about that. I want to know if you actually figure out the algorithm because you posted a workout video the other day you're half naked and you're holding a puppy. So A, <laughs> did it work? B, where do I get a puppy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was on my, that, actually, that's the funny thing is like being able to see all these, uh, all the different numbers is just like fascinating because um, I used to get a lot of shit. I still honestly get a lot of shit because I, I do a lot of stuff shirtless and uh, I have a shirt on right now because I'm about to see a patient, but hey, otherwise... Hate like... is going to hate. Hate is going to hate. If you want to take it off now, you can do it. <laughs> wow, this noise comes from the cheap seats exactly yeah. yeah so it's funny yeah like i've never been uh wanting to do things that i don't stand by or show stuff that's very questionable online i'd rather just put up whatever's there if it works out it works out i take some effort to it of trying to experiment with different formats of things but they're nothing fancy you know the difference in if i film an exercise and i film exercise all the time whether i'm with patients uh because I, I film pretty much half the stuff that my patients do I don't ever post it, but I just show them for feedback. And as I'm looking at it, I'm like, okay, well, this angle, if I was the observer, how does it look? And so then I just try to always think about some of that stuff. But half of it is, I know that if I'm going to put up like that, uh, the tantrum exercise that I initially did learn from you, Kier, um, I put it up the other day. And uh, when I'm thinking about like the angle of that, as I do that, it's like, Number one, which is going to catch the most attention. And then number two, which is going to also show the exercise the best that people understand what they need to do. Because that is an example is like people screwed up that exercise in a number of different ways. And I want to make sure that they understand that intent that needs to be there with it. And then also, if I don't film it from a reasonably good angle to attract attention, then people also aren't going to get the benefit of learning that movement. Yeah. Versus yeah, well, like, in all oh, sorry, sorry. I, interrupted you. I thought you were done. Uh, oh, go for you know, it. in all seriousness, like what you post is, is really cool now talking about all the other posts, the one about the um, ACL rehab the other day when the guy's doing all these different stimulus on the logic. And I know marrying up, like Keir said, like your physical therapy and your SNC and now the business side of things is at the end of the day, you're trying to build something. So you just sort of like balance between I want to get some attention through these things, but I also want to post quality stuff. If not, you just become that jester, just want to get likes and 
you know, they're all really fluff. You see, oh, like, yeah. all, all of us that like, we kind of have accounts, you'll see, like, okay, I may have 40,000 followers, but you look at the post and you get like 200 likes. And it's like, it, what is that? Like, you know, the, the numbers sort of dictate what you want to put in, you sort of sprinkle it around, do you? Yeah. It's, I think it has to be like that Venn diagram of like utility authenticity like a little bit of, of uh entertainment but i think it's like you know not that i'm not that i'm perfect like i i feel like what i am content to do more than other people is like minimize the gap between how i am on social media and how how i'm in real life like i hate to disappoint people i am this much of a prick in real life as well <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know i think you, you really hit the sweet spot um there but you know, going back to like this this dichotomy between performance oriented training and, and physical therapy, you you've straddled both worlds now. What is it that if you had a magic wand to wave and change one thing in both worlds to cross pollinate, what would it be? Uh, probably the first one would be ego, but uh, that's probably not going to change because that's just human yeah. society. But um, I guess like the hard part that I've seen from a lot of this stuff between going back and forth is the challenge and the role, because I think a lot of strength and conditioning coaches feel like if the physical therapist is essentially just doing exercise and it steps on their toes. Mm -hmm. And then the physical therapist feels like if they're just doing exercise, um, that they're nothing more than a strength and conditioning coach, which I think is a very shitty perspective, but the same, same end. And so just in order to go back and forth and like essentially really learn from each other about the, the things that can be taken away for, you know, better strength conditioning and better physical therapy. Yeah. I think it's the viewing that the other person in a way is either number one, lesser than them or two, that you can't work cohesively together for some reason that there does need to be this distinct dichotomy of I do these things and you do these things versus that there's a timeline or a role or like a guiding principle pathway within what, what we tried to do and we, you know, we managed it with one sport because obviously in, in college sport, you're kind of like limited by the personnel, like trying to spin all these plates. But one of the things that, you know, I learned the hard way when I was in Japan is if one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing, it's a gap between those two where athletes tend to get hurt. So as long as we were fairly explicit in terms of when they can do this, you're going to lead and I'll assist when they can do this, the roles will flip, but then being like trying to be fairly quantitative and qualitative and like the landmarks, like a criteria based progression. I think that's one thing where like, you know, I've spoken to people literally in the last month about like high level teams in one of the big four sports in America. And he made the mistake of asking them in an interview, like, what are the what are the quantitative criteria that you use to progress a rehab? And they're like, oh, you know, we may mostly go by feel, subjective pain, all this kind of stuff. And that like upset them a little bit. <laughs> yeah, actually, like uh, on the so one of my companies is called Ether Rehab, and we have a podcast. And uh, if people go and listen to all the episodes, they'll be able to find out what I'm referencing. But we interviewed an inter individual and a very similar experience, and just like blew me away that the person said this. Because, yeah, I'm an extremely quantitative guy. Like the post I put up the other day about the ACL patient, I ran through probably eight different objective tests to ensure that like I've now discharged them entirely before I was working with a strength conditioning coach as a back and forth with the individual as they were improving. But now I've completely passed them over to the strength coach. And uh, in the lead up to that, like I have objective data that I can say this person is prepared to go, to go do realistically whatever you want. Hmm. And yeah, I hear all the time about all these high performance settings that they just have no data. They don't test anything legitimately. It's just these arbitrary things of, do you feel good today? All right, you're done rehab. Yeah. Um, our monitoring in the morning includes, uh, I don't know if you've seen our Argentinian cultural beverage, sort of like a tea. And we have like, it's on like the schedule. It's like grass with boiling water on top. But anyway. <laughs> it's, well, that's what tea is, isn't it? Uh, I mean, you're from England. You put in a little sack, but it's the same thing. Uh, we're just it's absolutely here. not the same. It's the same thing. Anyway, so we would have like on the schedule, like monitoring like 8.30 to 9. And then monitoring would literally be sure I would be like, oh, do you want one? Yeah. How are you feeling? Now nah, I'm good. I don't think any player is ever going to say like, oh, I think I'm going to tear a hamstring today. <laughs> like, I, I feel a bit like Terry today. And, and you know by, <laughs> by experience here because you've shared all my nightmares that that communication and ego between people, which is the end goal. And I think every human relationship in any workplace is, 
it could be either your best ally. When I work with a with a good physio, at least someone I go along with, it was the best thing ever. And results were there. I don't know if we were both good or whatnot. But when I had the opposite, it was the worst nightmare. And the gap grew bigger and bigger until like you know players got injured, they got back to the field like unfit or unprepared or you know returns injury and you know one of us had to leave and it wasn't me <laughs> i'm just saying <laughs> so with with that said the flip side to that is the brain is the last thing to be rehabbed you, there, there are these studies out there about anxiety of, and its relationship to re-injury rates how and I've, I've had this conversation with john kiley where we, we were basically talking about it and he said you know if you look at chiropractic if you look at other modalities there is a huge component of belief and ritual and placebo there but he said you know the fact is you can still measure at the cellular level biochemical changes triggered by placebo effects and it's like hey you want those effects regardless of how they come. You're not going to hand back your gold medal if, if you say, oh, you know, this is unscientific. What are the, are there big pieces to your practice where you have that matrix of believability and efficacy where maybe the efficacy is not, not quite there, but then the, the, the placebo and the, the sense of well-being is? Yeah, so in all of my assessments, I go through and I discuss, I have like a list of these different interventions and things that people might do that I would call questionable. And I asked the person, you know, have you had any experience with this? How do you feel about this? Do you enjoy X, Y, and Z to try and gain an idea of like, where does this person currently stand? Because if they're an in individual who has high expectation and belief that hands-on therapy is going to be the thing to make them better, I don't want to ignore that because I do think that that would be inappropriate. I might not be the one to actually provide that, which is, I guess, where I differ because I think that number one in the care that I provide, cause I don't see people um, a ton from a standpoint of each individual case. Like I've got a patient now that I'm going to see and I, I will be doing his session today. And then he'll see a uh, strength and conditioning coach for two other sessions this week. And I guide those two sessions with the strength coach uh, at the gym that I own. I meet with the strength and conditioning staff and they have their list of clients that they each see that I also see some of. And we go through what their program is, changes for the program, et cetera, and how to implement that. And so even within the exercise, I don't oversee everything uh, personally. So then we still have discussion about it. But then with other modalities, interventions that are going to be ones that I maybe personally don't feel are the right ones for me to provide from a standpoint of ethical purposes, efficacy, um, money, uh, dollar for return on time investment, et cetera. I'm going to refer them to someone that's in my community and network that I've built, such as there's a massage therapist in town who I work with relatively closely because I'd sooner spend the 60 minutes I have the person with that's paying me, I'd say a quite high rate for, and then refer them to the massage therapist. And I've made an arrangement with them where normally they don't do 30 minute appointments, but they're willing to do them for my clients for a very reasonable rate. And I just send them enough that it's a good return for the person. And they do them in a way that I can send them an email and say, this person's going to come see you for these things. And this would be the general things I would suggest doing, but they obviously have the ability to decide whatever they do themselves. But then it goes in line with what I think this person's beliefs and expectations are. It's a better return on their dollar. And I think it's more in line with how it should be done versus me just saying, you know, this person believes that massage is like the key thing. And so I'll massage them for 30 minutes instead of loading them appropriately in the time that I can and also doing the best ability that I can personally, because I'm not a massage therapist. I can do a good enough job from evidence, but I might not be up to the standard that this person could provide and also dialed in focus on it. And from a standpoint of belief and effectiveness, I think that if you go and see someone who's a professional and expert at blank, you're probably going to get... Exactly. Yeah. So now is that and then, is that a conscious effort on your part to make what you do more scalable? Because it strikes me as that's a very clever way to do it. Uh, yeah. So I've had some people that are like business coaches uh, yeah. tell me that what I should do is I should actually get a kickback from all of the referrals that I do because I probably refer uh, like a ton of people and okay. uh, I don't do any of that. I just I just yeah. like to send people off and get better results. But the thing that I get from it is I get a ton of referrals from my patients. My patients are very happy because they feel taken 
care of. And uh, I've never once had a person say like they think that I'm seeing them too much because I see people very little. Yeah. And instead, they they get the advantages of me referring them out to the network that then takes care of them even beyond what would be normal rehab time. So it's almost it's like a, a good option. A, a parallel to professional sport where like you're you're the high performance manager and you're you're moving all the pieces around the board but then there are individual practitioners that is, is that like a conscious effort or you just evolved into that yeah that was uh i'd say it did evolve into that but it was a very conscious effort i yeah. i personally just viewed that uh, when i spent my time in the u.s as a physical therapist i just saw all these flaws in the way that a lot of the system is ran and then few. coming to canada it was a uh, I'd say actually exacerbated, probably worse. And really? uh, uh, yeah, I think a part of it is as much as I love socialized medicine, a uh, big part, uh, a big problem is that then there's just nothing really happens. People don't push a lot of things because at the end of the day, not to downplay it, but like they do receive their pay regardless. And yeah. so instead of like pushing for things to happen or pushing to get things to the next step, things just kind of sit still for a very long time and are very slow moving. In contrast, in the U.S., that did it was faster, but it wasn't necessarily well managed. And so then, when I'm here in a similar position, like there's just people will sit and nothing happens for them for a long time. And then, instead of allowing that to happen, I wanted to figure out a way to navigate that better. And um, from the standpoint of like what I believe on maximizing an individual's rehab for the vast majority of people that aren't professional athletes is to improve their health to the highest abilities as well, not just you got knee pain. Let's just look at your knee, and because right. 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 kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And so, in order to do that, I knew that I needed to get them physically active, which then required that I work with strength conditioning coaches to a higher degree. And since I've ran all my practices out of a gym, it was very easy. And then, um, once I started doing that, then it was okay. Well, I'm not going to massage these people. I'm not going to crack all these people. I'm not going to be zapping all these people. So who can I send them to for doing these things? And so then I just started to go and meet other clinicians. Uh, this might sound funny to people, but I actually like legitimately interviewed people to essentially decide whoever to refer, refer them to. Cause I didn't want to just What's your name? send them to a, yeah. I didn't want to send them to a dodgy massage therapist, a dodgy Cairo, anything like that. So it was like, how can I stand by whoever I send them to? So, so coming back to, to modalities, one thing that's come up for me like in the last few weeks where every well recently in the last few weeks Graham Morris a good friend of mine and I've had this conversation numerous times with other people and they just say you know whenever I have back pain I do PRI and I feel better but when you look at the explanations of PRI it's bull. <laughs> Like, oh, you know, you have to pull down this part of your diaphragm because the way your your vital organs are, uh, you know, organized in your, your thoracic cavity, the idea that you can, one, control that and two, do it when you're in sport. But people feel better. So to me, like the hidden third variable is probably like reintroduction of parasympathetic tone and maybe getting yeah. people out of like hyperextension like this. Are there other modalities that you think work but then the, the narrative that's put forward for it is flawed. Like we, we know it works, but we don't know why it works. Yeah, so I essentially do like uh, knock off PRI with way less education and information and yeah. do it with a reasonable amount of patients. And I give it as their self-management and self-time uh, choices. So as an example, a basketball player that I was working with, he gets a lot of quadratus lumborum area pain. And it's never during our sessions. He always reports that it's like from basketball, actual um, practice. And so then, you know, he'll get flared up at like 8 p.m. at night. And then whenever he has the flare up, he can't go to bed and he's in pain for like four or five hours. And when it finally goes down, he's got to get up the next morning for school. And it was like, okay, well, what do, what do I do for this? And number one, I can't be like, okay, go see a massage therapist at 8 p.m. at night. Not going to fly. Uh, I'm not going to come. I'm not going to come see you. So it was okay. Well, let's try and do these different positions. Uh, you know, as an example, one is like the 90, 90 feet on the wall kind of position and it's just super watered down. And it's like, I want you to think about these three things. Like get some posterior tilt. Cause I think it will lengthen the structure to a degree, get some deep diaphragmatic breathing, you know, your diaphragm breathes out of the way, but general principle, just so that he thinks about deep, deeper breaths. And then I want you just to relax as much as possible, spend 10 minutes there, get up, move around a little bit, repeat as you feel necessary. And I told him that. And then 
uh, he told me that the first night he had that, he did one round of it and felt way better. And it's like, okay, cool. I don't care how it happens. I don't care what it does. But at the end of the day, like I didn't give him this crazy narrative that his spine is out of place. And then if he does the wrong movement, it's going to pop out and whatever, which I think is more of the issue with PRI. Um, in contrast, it's like he can, he can do this whenever he wants. And it's a very simple intervention. He can do it anywhere. He doesn't need supervised management. He doesn't need to pay somebody for it. It's a simple thing and done. And so I give a, I, I'll go around and try different options, like sideline versions of different movements, uh, things that cause I have taken PRI education and then I'll just do it with people and see what happens. And I will agree, like there are, it doesn't work with everybody by any means, but there's certain things that you do see similar trends of which, especially I'd say similar personality types that seem to get a lot of benefit from it. Like if someone's really high strung, I find that it, it helps a ton. And I'd say that it's probably more the parasympathetic tone side of things. But you also see a lot of those same people in high performance sports um, versus like you don't see that as much with your average office worker. Do, do you reckon it has something to do between, you know, striking a balance between what you actually pick? You know, you know, it could be PRI, it could be like some magic voodoo. And how much weight does that have in his overall performance? So if it's just a tiny thing. Um, in contrast of just solely relying on that. It's like, oh, I don't want to do weights. I just want to do that. Then it's harmful. Whereas if you, you know, do all these things and then, yeah, you can have a PRI and it make you feel good. You know, I have that issue with like the um, colored tapes. It's sort of like, oh, I feel like muscle loaded. So I'm just going to put this colored thing that's going to like the drain only, the my blood. I've ever heard of that is Argentina. Argentina Mate, is the only place I've ever my, seen that. My, my, my dudes, I walk in and the new physios come in. It's just like my new next thing is going to, convince them out of it but how much time do you want to spend doing that yeah. versus you know how much harm does it do i always come in and be like oh your knee's dirty i was like oh you were playing tic-tac-toe and just making those jokes but if they're fine with it like it's not like you know what i mean like how, what do you reckon the um the, the key is striking that balance or what was it like well not to give a big plug to the fundamentals course but i think the uh <laughs> god bless you mate <laughs> 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 the uh one of the early ones i think it's actually like the first section that's on the mindset and critical thinking i think that is huge and at the end of the day most people don't have that skill set because if you come into it and you're number one you can't critically evaluate and decide whether the efficacy is there on something well then you're going to definitely buy into whatever the believed thing is like with what you're talking about i think you're talking about like kk is that right yeah uh, uh, yeah, yeah i think that's what it is I don't know <clears throat> yeah like if you can Think about the, the physiological arguments. It's extremely obvious if you have reasonable <laughs> physiology knowledge, how flawed that is. What, if it helps someone, it's a different discussion, just like with the PRI thing. Um, but you can understand that there's just no way that it's lifting your skin or that it's causing wow. extra space okay. or any of these claimed beliefs. Draining, so, draining all the, um, the stuff, <laughs> whatever yeah. that is. <laughs> like increasing blood flow, okay. <laughs> good job um so i think that if you're able to do that then it starts to decipher when you see things for what they're most likely doing then you can discern where they fit into different places because if you have x deficit or you need y physiological change or some sort of blank then you start to look at okay well what can fill that need what can do that service for me versus i do pri for everything i do k tape for everything it's it's okay. Now I can, I hate the analogy of like, I have a tool for different toolbox or I have a toolbox with different tools, but it's more of, I have these things that I can select appropriately. I can find the appropriate tool for the intervention. You know, when you have a carpenter, they have very few tools that they regularly go to, but they do have additional tools in their toolbox that they go to if the case actually requires it. But the vast majority of their time is spent with very minimal things that they select and they really hone the ability with those things. But if the job can't be done with it for some reason, they do have additional uh, tools to go and grab. On, yeah. on the, uh, uh, like the counter to that, is there ever stuff that you would that you feel does have utility that like traditional education might say is contraindicated? And one of the things that jumps out to me is rounded back lifting. So it seems that when I first started out, you know, 15 plus years ago, it was very much flexion is the devil. Your, you know, your L5 S1 is going to shoot out the back of you if, if you do any kind of load deflection. And it definitely seems that in you know more recent years it's swung back towards the middle or even you know a little bit the other way with like is it Jefferson 
Jefferson curls from gymnastic type programs and you see all these like lunatic, mm. you know, former Soviet lifters doing crazy stuff. What do you think about that? I think that's a, a combination, at least in my world, is a combination of more emerging information and also better evidence-based practice. I think previously there was a lot of individuals that would share information, like there's a known spine doctor with lots of textbooks that would say information and people would just take him as like the <laughs> yeah he may be he may be <laughs> um and you know he would just say whatever he believed and people would just accept it because he had a list of references but no one necessarily checked the references or or critically approached them well the fact and... that you know human tissue is adaptive and it's not pig spines exactly so I think that's been a big change of that as we've gained more information, we've gained more critical thought on these different subjects and started to explore different options. It's changed to a degree. Like in the case of spinal flexion, I don't think that it, I wouldn't do a Jefferson curl with the vast majority of team sport athletes mm. uh, or even a rounded back deadlift necessarily. You might make an argument for some positions, but the vast majority, it, I don't see them. They're in a highly flexed position uh, with a um, load that's going up and down. In contrast, you, you look at like, um, the scrum in rugby, like that is a very different type of load than a rounded back deadlift. Like it's a horizontally loaded directed. Yeah. So well, I think of is like, um, wrestling, wrestling, yeah, that's strong men, lifting stones, all this kind of stuff. Well, again, <clears throat> I feel like you have to learn the rules before you, you give yourself license to bend them. Well, mm-hmm. in rugby, you do have jackling on the floor. They're basically yeah. in a squat position. And they completely yeah. curve back with the hands and the feet and they're just pulling something and being hit at the same time. But that's a different story. <laughs> but the movements there, like the moment I started getting like photos from the players and videos, I started watching the games. I'm like, they get in all these weird positions. Jiu-jitsu like, too. Yeah, and I don't want to go like put a bar on the same position be like functional and stuff. But there's definitely load and there's definitely an angle and speed of force and what whatnot that makes you think like, wow, my gym is just really, I think one this one thing is going to solve everything. And it, mm-hmm. it's not going to like, to go further, you know what I mean? Like, like Sam said, be, uh, definitely not the beginning, but when you don't even know how to move, you're a teenager, you don't even know who you are. But you know what I mean? Like, it, it makes you wonder, like, how much time do I spend in the gym and how little with understanding yeah. how to load different things? Because... I cannot square in a bar or under a bar and set some reps would be like, ah, it's not symmetric. Ah, like what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's, it comes back to as a strength conditioning coach, what is your desired outcome? What am I looking for from a performance standpoint? But then as a physical therapist, it's what am I looking for to help? I guess both, uh, both strength coach and physical therapist. What am I looking for to reduce injury risk? And a part of that is going to be, how can I create the tissue specifically to be more resilient to that? And a consideration, you know, in this specific one that you pointed out here is, you know, we do know for a fact that you can actually have adaptations at the spine, both at a bone level, a disc level, a ligament level with training positions that are more flexed, et cetera. And that will have adaptations occur. What those adaptations are as a bit of room for discussion, but if you're looking to increase your ability to manage a more flexed over position, we need to create some end plate adaptations. And that's only going to come by loading a person in a more flexed position generally. I've always so then, this about ACLs as well. Yeah. And we're seeing that now. That's, that's a perfect point too, is now we've seen, uh, there's been a few different papers showing that we have hypertrophy of ACLs in individuals that load them uh, in challenging positions and don't tear them. And so then is it possible that, you know, you've got a bunch of athletes who have that do end up tearing their ACL have neglected loading it in a a position and then end up tearing it when they're forced to load it in those positions. If we keep teaching people knees back, um, knees out, et cetera, in every position, well, then their ACL doesn't necessarily get stressed to a reasonable level in a safe environment that's progressively overloaded across time. And then you say, okay, now go play a high level game and they get pushed into that position, well, what's going to break? Obviously, the thing that's not prepared for it. That's how you like Gaelic football and, and the drops they have when the knee, like, yeah. should be broken. And you'd be like, how do the <laughs> guys stand up? Like, you can't explain that by luck. I mean, at least not in this video. <laughs> like, oh, I was just lucky. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about, like, you see in the NBA, it's like, you, you have these people like 
you know, Valgus is the devil, knees in, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, you see guys landing in unilateral stance in the NBA all the time. And you're like, that should break. And it's like, you, I think, you, I, does Valgus increase the risk of an ACL rupture? Yes, but you also have to wear the hidden graveyard. Like, there's a lot of dudes in the NBA that do that thousands of times over the course of their career, completely healthy. Yeah, exactly. So on the topic of health, new baby congratulations thank you how, how has that been the second time around uh uh interesting there's parts yeah. of it that are i'd say <laughs> like the first time uh i grew up uh helping raise my niece and so then i i knew some stuff but i obviously wasn't a legitimate parent and so then uh coming into the first one it's like you get hit with all these things especially when you're the actual parent because now you have fear associated with like everything yeah um and uh i'd say that a lot of that has gone this time like you know my daughter the second daughter cries and i'm like ah she's fine like whatever and uh <laughs> but then at the, at the other side is like with baby two i have baby one still and uh yeah. so my daughter's not with me today but i'd say uh, like today's a wednesday so most monday tuesday and wednesdays my daughter comes with me to work uh she meets all my patients she comes and hangs out while i do uh, training, filming, all of it, just because my wife's too overwhelmed with, you know, a brand new newborn to also have a toddler full time. Yeah. So then that's been a huge change where, uh, like, right during the whole pregnancy, it was like, I was essentially able to go do whatever I wanted from a work standpoint, go do what I needed to come home and be with my daughter still, but it wasn't like I had a kid with me all the time. Whereas <laughs> uh, up until like last week, I had my daughter with me probably like four or five days a week from the time she woke up till the time she went to bed which she's was gonna take over the empire one day she's gonna grow up like s and c from from a kid I've got all these videos because i just think both. it's adorable so yeah so i've just been like keeping track and recording stuff because it's real cute like she'll come over and start like uh coaching people on different stuff like she doesn't legitimately know but it's just so precious when i've got like this 16 year old basketball player who she like has come close with and he's like six foot nine or something and uh she's I don't know three feet tall and he's doing jumps and she's like going over and like yelling at him to jump higher and it's like <laughs> this is perfect so I'll just keep and all these and once she's way in front of the, so front many of the camera that's a tax write-off exactly yeah <laughs> baby's coaching likes <laughs> right all right uh where can people find you uh, yes, yeah, so if they want to track me down, I've got Instagram, Dr. Dr. Sam Spinelli. You can also find me on YouTube. I've got a channel called Citizen Athletics and then a YouTube channel called E3 Rehab and just content all over the place across those. Awesome, man. All right. Well, uh, we won't keep you any longer. Let you get ready for this, uh, this patient. Sounds good. Thank you, guys.